Hi, everybody, and welcome back for another exciting week of Spanish grammar. Uh, this week, we will be exploring Chapter 6, which includes indirect object pronouns, the verbs decir and dar, uh, gustar, and similar like verbs, um, the preterite tense, which is one of the two past tenses in Spanish, cargarzar verbs, hacer in time expressions in the past, and stem changing verbs in the preterite tense. So we have a lot going on this week, and I always like to make a YouTube video to help my online students progress throughout the content and receive a little bit of help with some of the more difficult grammar topics in the course. So um, this will probably be a rather lengthy video. Fortunately, you have the option of listening um, on your own time when it works best for you. And um, you're always welcome to pause and replay those concepts that were really difficult to understand and sort of hear it again. Uh, there'll be a few moments where I ask you to pause your audio and work out a few problems and practice and then check your answers and replay. So um, I'm hoping that this video and these grammar snapshots sort of simulate an in-person class for you in the same way that in a real classroom your professor might go over uh, whatever grammar topic have you practice a few problems, and then you guys might go over it together on the board. So same sort of um, setup here, but in an online format. So as we get started here, you may remember back to your Spanish 1 class where you learned about your subject pronouns in Spanish. Um, I love this box. I call it in my classes the magical box, and we spend a lot of time discussing this box. So let's very quickly just recap a few things and make sure you know um, what you're talking about and that you're prepared for the Spanish 2 content. Uh, so here's we look. You hopefully know that yo means I. Tu is you, informal. We have el, which means he, ella, she, and usted is you, formal. Up here we have both nosotros and nosotras, which both mean we, and vosotros and vosotras, which both mean you all in Spain. Ellos and ellas both mean they, and ustedes is you all. Now take note, nosotros, vosotros, and ellos are all masculine plural, and nosotras, vosotras, and ellas are all feminine plural. Hopefully you know that. In Spanish 1, we also talked about the conjugation process for verbs in the present tense. So verbs that end in AR, such as hablar, you removed the AR and added back O, AS, A, AMOS, AIS, and AN. So a verb like hablar, when you chopped off your AR, you ended up with hablo, hablas, habla, hablamos, hablais, and hablan. For verbs that have an ER ending, such as comer, we added different endings. O, es, e, hemos, es, en. So you ended up with como, comes, come, comemos, comes, and comen. Same for verbs that end in IR, such as escribir. You end up with escribo, escribes, escribe, escribimos, escribís, and escriben. Notice there's a slight difference here in your ER and IR verb endings um, in that the nosotros and vosotros forms are slightly different with emos and is as opposed to emos and is. So you have those um, there for you with an I instead of an E. Okay? Um, so that's a brief little recap of Spanish 1 and hopefully you remember those things. Um, here in Espanol 2, we're going to discuss these indirect object pronouns. And um, unfortunately, we don't teach as much grammar in the K-12 through world as um, there used to be out there. So a lot of students hear the word indirect object and kind of freak out like, oh my gosh, what's that? Okay, so first I'm going to tell you what an indirect object is in English, and then we'll explore it together in Spanish. Okay, so an indirect object answers the question of to or for whom an action is carried out. So um, here are two sentences in English. I give you the book. To whom was the book given? It was given to you. So you, in this case, is your indirect object. Um, you tell me a story. To or for whom was the story told? It was told to me. So me is my indirect object pronoun. In Spanish, our indirect objects, to say two or four me, we say me. Two or four you, we say te. Two or four him, her, or you formal, we say le. Two or four us, nos. Two or four you all in Spain, os. And two or four them or you all, 
les. So we have repitan me, te, le, nos, os, les. Say those with me. Me, te, le, nos, os, and les. Hopefully you're recognizing these from Espanol Uno. Um, we saw all of these things in front of the verb gustar, to say I like, me gusta, you like, te gusta. Literally, to or for me it was pleasing, to or for you it was pleasing. So you sort of already know these things, you maybe just didn't realize they were indirect object pronouns. Now, um, as you begin looking at these indirect objects, um, generally speaking, these are always placed in front of your conjugated verb. We will talk about that more in just a moment. They agree in number with the noun to whom they refer. For example, le lavo los platos. To or for him, her, or you, I will wash the dishes. And we'll talk about how that's a little ambiguous in a moment. Okay, um, I'll wash the dishes for you, te lavo los platos. I'll wash the dishes for him, le lavo los platos. I'll wash the dishes for us, nos lavo los platos. So you can interchange any of these indirect object pronouns, depending on to or for whom the action is performed, and it will go in front of your conjugated verb. Now, in the event that you are um, making a negative expression and you're saying no, then your indirect object pronoun comes between no and your conjugated verb, okay? For example, I don't recommend that restaurant to you. No te recomiendo ese restaurante. The te was placed between no and recomiendo, your conjugated verb, okay? Now, um, speakers, native speakers of English often have trouble with the placement of these indirect object pronouns. So um, you have a couple options, okay? Option number one, you can place the indirect object pronoun before your conjugated verb. Option two, you can attach your indirect object pronoun to the infinitive or to the present participle. Now, we're back to those fancy grammar terms when students start to look at me like a deer in the headlights, like, oh my gosh, what's an infinitive? Okay, so recall from Spanish one that an infinitive is any word that ends in AR, ER, or IR, and it's often translated as to and something else. So you know, hablar was to talk. Comer was to eat. Escribir was to write. So, in the sentence that follows, we have el mesero, the waiter, nos tiene que, to or for us has to, traer la cuenta. So option one is placing your nos, your indirect object pronoun, to or for us, in front of your conjugated verb, which in this case is tiene. Um, so el mesero nos tiene que traer la cuenta. The waiter, to or for us, has to bring the bill. Um, Option two was attaching this to the infinitive, which you can see here in green. El mesero tiene que traernos la cuenta. In this case, they attach the nos to traer. Notice it is all one word. There is not a space between traer and nos. Uh, the waiter has to bring us la cuenta. Now, in my experience, a lot of native speakers of Spanish tend to attach um, their indirect object pronouns with the infinitive or the participle. Um, you may choose to do either option. I always recommend to my students that if you want to be extra sure and you're just never you're never positive in a sentence when you're attaching, then just put it in front of the conjugated verb. Okay, if you're unsure, find the conjugated verb of your sentence and place it there. Another example for you. El mesero me está sirviendo la sopa. The waiter, to or for me, is serving the soup. In this case, está sirviendo was my conjugation. The indirect object pronoun came directly in front. Your second option, again, you can attach to the present participle, which in this case is sirviendo. So, el mesero está sirviéndome la sopa. Now, in this case, with both of these options, with both traernos and sirviendo, um, there should be a written accent on both of the E's here because you're placing a, um, that's where your stress goes whenever you're saying this word aloud. So, traernos and sirviéndome. Uh, you can kind of hear the accent there on both of the E's. So, um, like I said, if in doubt, place your indirect object in front of your conjugated verb, but you do have the option of attaching as well. Um, now, there are some cases of ambiguity where something is unclear. 
Let's go back to this earlier example of le lavo los platos. If you just say le lavo los platos, it's unclear. I'll wash the dishes for him, I'll wash the dishes for her, or I'll wash the dishes for you formal. Well, who exactly are you washing these dishes for, okay? We need to be clear. Um, now, in this case, if you would like to add clarity, you can add a prepositional phrase, a, and a subject afterwards. So, for example, we have le preparamos la cena, which by itself means I'll prepare, or sorry, we will prepare dinner for her, we will prepare dinner for him, or we will prepare dinner for you formal. If we want to make it clear as to whom we are preparing dinner for, we could say le preparamos la cena a Maria. So, to or for Maria, we are preparing dinner. Okay? Um, another example, les trago un refresco. I will bring a soft drink to you all or to them. Well, if you want to specify to whom you are bringing the soft drink, les trago un refresco a ustedes. So you have um, the clarity here in your prepositional phrase, a Maria or a ustedes. So make sure that you um, take note of that. Occasionally, you may also add this prepositional phrase to show emphasis as well. So, um, the common one here is um, whenever you're, you're saying that I was inviting you and not someone else. So, te invito a un café a ti, no a ellos. So, I invited you for a coffee, not them, right? Te invito a un café a ti, a ti, okay? So, uh, you're showing that emphasis there. Or, Juan nos va a hacer un pastel especial a nosotros. He's making us a special cake, right? You're just really emphasizing uh, to whom or for whom those, those actions take place. Okay, I would like for you at this moment to pause your audio and give these questions a try just to see what you're understanding. You are going to be using these indirect object pronouns. Me, te, le, nos, os, or les. So one, two, three, pause your audio and give this a try. Okay, hopefully you've had a moment to, to attempt these. In number one, there is a part A and B here. In number two, there's only one blank. So in part one, mesero. Hey, waiter, dude, mesero, mesero. Blank trae la sopa, por favor. So, hey, waiter, dude, would you bring blank the soup, please? And in parentheses, we have a mi. We're saying, would you bring me the soup? Me trae la sopa, por favor. And um, he says, si, sí, senora, yes, miss, or yes, ma'am. Blank traigo la sopa ahora mismo. So, I will bring you the soup right this moment, right now. Now, a lot of students get this one wrong because we're saying, I will bring you. And they quickly look and say, oh, I'll bring you, it's going to be te. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because we're saying that I will bring you formally. Remember, he called her Mrs. He called her ma'am. So in this case, we're going to use you formal. So it should be le traigo. I will bring you. Le traigo la sopa. Um, and as you continue into number two, paloma. So paloma debe servir blank la sopa. You should serve to someone la sopa. And then notice you have a prepositional phrase here at the end which clarifies to whom you should serve the soup. And it tells you that, Paloma, you should serve the soup a los señores en la mesa número tres, to the people um, in table number three. So the people in table number three, think back, would the people in table number three be I, you, he, she, we, they, or you all? Hopefully you're saying it would be they or them. So if we look back at our indirect object pronoun for to or for them, you should arrive with les here. So, Paloma debe servir les, la sopa, a los señores en la mesa número tres. And in this case, this will be all one word, servirles. You should serve them, okay? It's being attached to the infinitive, whereas in the other two, it was placed in front of the conjugated verb. Okay, something else you may be asked to do with this, um, say in my Spanish lab, perhaps, um, you may be asked to uh, read a paragraph 
and fill in the indirect object pronouns that correspond. So, I told you we're talking about David's blog here, El Blog de David, David in Espanol, and it tells you that your friend David has started a blog to continue practicing his Spanish while he's studying abroad, but you've noticed that he's forgotten to include the indirect object pronouns in his post. So let's help him edit this by filling in the blanks with the correct indirect object pronouns. For example, um, vivo en un apartamento cerca de la universidad aquí. So I'm living in an apartment close to the university here in Viña del Mar con mi mejor amigo Efraín. Me gusta vivir con él. I like to live with him because, ¿por qué? Nos divertimos. We have a lot of fun together. Y es un buen compañero de apartamento. He's a good um, roommate, a good companion of the apartment, literally, a good roommate. Um, por la mañana, in the morning, yo, blank, preparo un poco de desayuno a él. So in the mornings, I prepare a little bit of breakfast for him, a él, porque me gusta levantarme temprano. So as you're filling in the blank here, to or for whom am I preparing a breakfast? Well, I'm preparing it for him, a él. So in this case, if you look back, to or for him, we would say le. So I should place le in front of preparo here. Take a moment, pause this audio, and give number two a try. Okay, hopefully you've had a moment now to try number two, which says a veces, sometimes, el blank compra a mí El almuerzo en la cafetería de la universidad. So sometimes he blank purchases or he blank buys a mí. We're saying he buys me lunch in the cafeteria of the university. So if he buys me, to say to or for me, we should say, good. Hopefully you're saying me, me, which is the correct option here. Okay. Um, We'll move on to our next grammar focus now. Uh, that, that wraps up our discussion of indirect object pronouns. There are two verbs here that appear in this chapter. These verbs are decir, repitan, decir, decir, which means to say or to tell, and repitan, dar, dar, which means to give. So you have decir and dar. Um, both of these are irregular verbs. Uh-oh, okay. We'll talk about why they're irregular in just a moment. But you have decir and dar as two irregular verbs, and they're very, very commonly used with these indirect object pronouns, which is why your book places them in this chapter. So, with the verb decir, which again means to say or to tell, it does have a stem change from e to i. So you change your e here to an i, you remove your ir, and add your present tense endings of o, es, e, imos, is, and n. Um, this works perfectly for every form except for the yo form. We end up with dices, dice, decimos, decis, and dicen, which is perfect. However, the yo form um, would appear as dico, which is not a word. Okay, dico is not a word. So in this case, your C changes to G, and this is known as an irregular yo verb, obviously because the yo form is irregular. So digo, dices, dice, decimos, decis, and dicen. So having some knowledge of how stem changers work from Espanol Uno um, should make this fairly easy. The only one you really have to spend some time on is digo here. You may also recall learning about yo-go verbs in Spanish 1000 where we learned about hago and traigo and pongo, all those verbs that didn't go, they were regular yo verbs. Same type of thing here with digo, okay? Um, an example of how this is accompanied with an indirect object pronoun you see, siempre le decimos buenos días al maestro. So, siempre le decimos, always to or for him, we say or we tell good morning to the waiter. So, notice, al mesero is um, our prepositional phrase here, which clues us in that we should use le prior to our conjugated verb. So, there's that indirect object pronoun from earlier. Decimos, in this case, is conjugating conjugated according to who does the saying or who does the telling. So you could change this and say siempre le digo buenos días al maestro. I always tell the waiter good morning. Or siempre le dices buenos días al maestro. Always to or for him, you say good morning. So um, any form of decir would be acceptable here. Um, but notice your le agrees with al maestro, not with the person doing the saying. 
Another verb in this chapter is dar, which again means to give. Same type of thing, dar is an irregular yo verb. The yo form becomes doi. Um, not all that irregular. Uh, if you just added your, removed your ar and added your endings of o, a, sa, amos, ice, and an, you would end up with do, which is also not a word. So we arrive at doi and irregular. So doi, das, da, damos, dais, and dan. An example of how this is often used with an indirect object pronoun, you see that la mesera siempre nos da un buen servicio. So the waitress always to or for us gives good service. Now, da, in this case, our verb, is conjugated according to the waitress because the waitress is the one who is giving the good service. So da, our verb, is conjugated according to our subject, la mesera. La mesera siempre nos da un buen servicio. In this case, nos has to agree. Um, it's depending on to whom the good service is given. So, la mesera siempre me da un buen servicio. She always gives me a good service. La mesera siempre le da un buen servicio. She always gives a good service to or for him, her, or you formal. In this case, we're just saying nos da. She always gives us a good service. Um, okay, I'd like for you to pause your audio and give these two blanks a try, which relate to both decir and dar. You're going to use decir in one of these and dar in the other. Uh, if you need your conjugations, they're right back here. Digo, dices, dice, decimos, decís, and dicen. Doy, das, da, damos, dais, and dan. Por favor, go ahead and give this a try. Okay, hopefully you had a moment to attempt these. In number one, we have that la mesera, the waitress, me to or for me, blank una ensalada de tomate y cebolla. So the waitress to or for me, blank, a salad of tomato and onion. So she always says me a salad of tomato and onion, or she always gives me a tomato and onion salad. Hopefully the latter sounds better. She always gives me. So we should conjugate dar to give here. According to la mesera, she. So if we find our she box here, la mesera siempre me da una ensalada de tomate y cebolla. Y yo, and I, le, to her for her, blank, gracias. So I always say to her, using the form decir here, I always say to her thank you. So the yo form of decir, if we look back, should be digo. So siempre le digo gracias. Okay, something you might also be asked to do with this on my Spanish lab is you may be asked to use dar and decir in sentences, just like we did before, by filling in the blank correctly. Um, so I'm going to do one for you, and then I'll let you pause this and give a couple others a try. So number one tells you that mis amigos, my friends, blank, que hay una fiesta en la casa de Pilar este fin de semana. So my friends, blank, that there's a party at Pilar's house this weekend. So, my friends give that there's a party at Pilar's house, or my friends say that there's a party at Pilar's house. It should be say, so we're using decir. As I conjugate decir according to my friends or they, you may look back and see that the they box here is dicen. So, mis amigos, dicen que hay una fiesta en la casa de Pilar este fin de semana. I'd like for you to pause this and give number two a try. Okay. Now that you've had a moment to attempt this, we see that Paulo y Felipe, so Paulo y Felipe, they, me, to or for me, blank, un abrazo cuando me siento triste. Paulo and Felipe, to or for me, blank, a hug when I feel sad. They give me a hug or they say me a hug. Hopefully they give me a hug, so we're taking dar, we're conjugating it again according to the they form to say that Paulo and Felipe, they give... So our answer here should be Dan. Dan. Okay, be careful. This is not pronounced Dan. Dan is a man's name. Dan means they give. So be careful there. Okay, so we've discussed our indirect objects, indirect object pronouns, and the verbs decir and dar. Let's move on to discuss gustar and similar verbs. Okay, as you look here, um, hopefully you recall back from Español Uno where we discussed um, gustar, me gusta, te gusta, le gusta, nos gusta, os gusta, and les gusta. To say that I like, you like, he or she likes, we like, you all in Spain like, or they like. Now, something interesting about the verb gustar 
is that it is literally translated as to be pleasing to. So um, you will see that in front of gusta or gustan, you see an indirect object pronoun. Me gusta, to or for me, it pleases. Or me gustan, to or for me, they please. Te gusta, to or for you, it pleases. Or te gustan, to or for you, they please. Okay, so for example, me gustan los camarones. I like shrimp, okay? Or literally, to or for me, the shrimp are pleasing. In this case, camarones is a plural. There's multiple shrimp here. So I'm using gustan instead of gusta. It's a very common error for speakers of English to say, me gusta los camarones, which is incorrect, right? We should say, me gustan los camarones, because camarones is plural. Now, if I throw an infinitive in front, we would still um, use gusta. For example, me gusta comer los camarones. I like to eat shrimp, okay? It doesn't matter that there's multiple shrimp here because comer is an infinitive. Recall from earlier, an infinitive is any word that ends in ar, er, or ir. So therefore, we should say me gusta comer. I like to eat. Doesn't matter if you're eating shrimp, steak, french fries, or an apple, okay? Regardless of what you're eating, you're saying me gusta comer, there's an infinitive there, so I should use gusta, okay? Again, you can see it's very common to see a prepositional phrase uh, according to who likes to do the eating. So, a Jorge no le gustan los tomates, or no le gustan los tomates a Jorge. So, to George, tomatoes are not pleasing, or George doesn't like tomatoes. A Jorge no le gustan los tomates. Um, you can see the a Jorge part may appear both at the beginning or at the end. Completely optional. A Jorge no le gustan los tomates. Or les gusta a ustedes cenar. Or les gusta cenar a ustedes. In this case, the prepositional phrase a Jorge or a ustedes um, is clarifying to or for whom the le or les refers to. So remember from earlier, with le or les, you may need to specify. Are we saying without the a Jorge, we don't know who doesn't like tomatoes, okay? Without the a ustedes, we don't know who we're asking if they would like to have dinner with us. So remember, you need to show those clarifying statements with prepositional phrases with le or les. Um, now, I recapped all of this for you because there are more verbs that function in this same light as gustar. Um, notice we always use gusta or gustan in the third person singular or third person plural boxes to say that it pleases or they please. So gusta or gustan. Um, these other verbs, uh, which we'll explore in a moment, they're all here. Aburrir, to bore. Apetecer, to feel like or to appeal to. Encantar, to love or to be extremely pleasing to. Fascinar, to fascinate. Interesar, to interest. Molestar, to bother or to annoy, parecer, to seem, or querer, to be left over or to be remaining. All of these verbs are going to be conjugated just like gustar, either in the singular third person box or the plural third person box, so either gusta or gustan. Now, several of these are ER and IR verbs, so for example, aburrir would become either aburre or aburren. So, me aburre, it bores me. Me aburren, they bore me. Okay? Or, same thing with encantar. Me encanta, I love, or me encantan. Um, to or for me, they are very pleasing. Or, I really love them. Okay? Um, me molesta or me molestan. You're always using either this he, she, it, or they box. Okay? So, um, third person singular or third person plural. As we look at these, I'll do one example for you here, and then I'm gonna give you a moment to pause your audio. Okay, here you see a series of three questions, and it tells you that you're completing your sentence with the most logical option, either le encantan, no me gustan, or nos quedan. Okay, so you have to remember what these mean from before. Um, so remember your indirect object pronoun in the front is describing to or for whom something happens, so le, to or for him, to or for her, or to or for you formal, me, to or for me, and nos, to or for us. 
Encantar comes from the verb encantar, to love or to be very pleasing to. No me gustan, obviously from gustar, to not like or not be pleasing to. And quedan, to be left over. So as you look at number one, in la cocina, in the kitchen, a mi blank las cebollas. So something cebolla, something onions. Now, you see a mi, which tells you it's two or four me, meaning it has to be no me gustan. You've identified that just by looking at um, the prepositional phrase here, a mi, no me gustan. Um, now, just to clarify, it is gustan here because we're talking about multiple cebollas, multiple onions. So a mi, no me gustan las cebollas. I don't like onions. Por eso, therefore, no voy a ponerlas en la ensalada. So I don't like onions, so I'm not putting them on the salad. Pero mira, but look. And then it continues. So, por favor, go ahead and pause your audio and give these a try. Okay, now that you've had a moment to try, it says, pero mira, but look, blank muchas fresas. But look, there are blank a lot of strawberries. We're saying there are a lot of strawberries left over. So we have a lot of strawberries left. Nos quedan. Nos quedan muchas fresas. We have a lot of strawberries left over. Vamos a hacer una mermelada. We're going to make a mermelada, like a jam or a jelly. Um, y voy a prepararle un jugo de zanahorias a Gustavo porque blank las verduras. And I'm going to make um, a carrot juice for Gustavo because he loves the vegetables. Notice a Gustavo, two or for him. Tell us we're going to be using le. And in Cantan, he loves vegetables, las verduras, which are plural. So we used in Cantan. Okay. Something else you may be asked to do in my Spanish lab is to select within a sentence the correct option. Now, be very careful here. You need to read the entire question before you make an answer because there's more than one right answer that might agree, but it might not make sense in the sentence. So for example, number one, a mí me blank mucho la historia de Chile. So I blank a lot Chile's history. I am bored by it or I'm interested in it. In this case, historia, history, is what we're going to use um, to, to make agree with our verb. So a mí me Aburre, la historia de Chile would work, but because you're saying history, it bores me. Again, using the he, she, or it box, singular, the bottom left box. So, me aburre, it bores me. Or, me interesa, it interests me. Now, in this case, both of these are totally grammatically correct. But when you read the rest of the sentence, a mí me blank mucho la historia de Chile, es un país fascinante. This last little part is relevant. It's a fascinating country. Well, if it's fascinating, you're probably not saying that it was boring, right? So in this case, your correct answer should be that me interesa la historia de Chile. Okay, so be careful with those. Um, okay, so we've discussed our indirect objects. We've discussed gustar and similar verbs. Um, now, I'm going to kind of blow up your brain just a little bit here as we discuss the Spanish preterite tense. Now, the preterite is one of two past tenses in Spanish. Whoa, hold the phone. You mean there are two past tenses? Yes, in Spanish there are two past tenses. You're going to learn about the preterite in this chapter. And in chapter 8, we'll discuss the imperfect. So, as of right now, you need to know about the preterite, which is one of the two past tenses. Uh, typically, we use the preterite for talking about actions that were completed at a specific point in the past. So, preparé una sopa de mariscos para la cena. I prepared um, a shellfish soup for dinner. It's a completed action. Dinner is past. I prepared the soup. We also use the preterite to talk about actions that have a very specific beginning and a very specific end. So, ayer, yesterday, nos levantamos, nos duchamos, nos vestimos y salimos para la universidad. So yesterday, we got up, we showered, we got dressed, and we left for the university. Okay, a series of events all taking place there. Getting dressed, showered, getting up, going to the university. Um, and we also use the preterite for narrating a story in the past. So my favorite example, if you've ever seen the movie Shrek, 
Shrek fue al bosque, salvó la princesa y regresó a casa. He went to the woods, saved the princess, and returned home. Boom, boom, boom. Series of events, narrating a story. Okay? Um, we'll discuss more reasons as to why you would use the preterite a little bit later. Um, but for now, I want you to know how to conjugate it. So go back to the present tense when you had these AR verbs. O, as, a, amos, ais, anon. ER verbs, O, A, S, A, so on and so forth. You memorize these endings for AR, ER, and IR verbs. We're going to do the same thing with the preterite tense, but there will be some new endings that you must memorize. So, for the preterite, for an AR verb, we add back in E with an accent pronounced as E, E. For the to form, we add back ASTE. For the he or she form, we add back O. Notice that O has an accent here. For the nosotros and nosotras forms, we add back amos. For the vosotros and vosotras forms, we add back astes. And for the ellos, ellas, ustedes forms, we add back aron. Okay? So, repitan. E, aste, o, amos, astes, aron. One more time. E, aste, o, amos, astes, aron. Okay? So, you have these preterite endings for an AR verb. For an ER verb... Um, and an IR verb, the endings are the same, which is kind of convenient, okay? So you only have to memorize two sets of endings here. So ER and IR verbs. Here we have E, written as I with an accent, E, the two form, ISTE, the he or she, IO, the we form, IMOS, the vosotros, ISTES, and the they form, IERON. So what, repitan por favor, I, ISTE, IO, Imos, istes, ieron. One more time. I, iste, io, imos, istes, ieron. So you have these er and ir verbs. We talked about their uses. There are also some words that often trigger the preterite tense. By the way, um, some books spell preterite with an e, others spell it without an e. It, I think it's a personal preference thing. I learned growing up to spell it with an e. So that's how I spell it, but your book uses, does not use an E. So in case you're wondering why there's a difference there. Anyway, uh, there are these words that trigger the preterite, such as ayer, yesterday, anteayer, the day before yesterday, anoche, last night, la semana pasada, last week, una vez, once or one time, really anything with pasado or pasada, so el año pasado, last year, el mes pasado, last month, el lunes pasado, last Monday. El viernes pasado, last Friday. Anything with pasado. All of these refer to a very specific time. Yesterday, the day before yesterday, last week, last year, last night. Very specific times, so they are using the preterite. Okay, I'd like for you to give uh, these verb conjugations a try. I'll do one for you here. We have the verb dibujar. Just like all of our other verbs, we're going to start conjugating dibujar by chopping off the AR. We're left with dibuj. Okay, um, in the yo form, you may remember for an AR verb, our endings are e, aste, o, amos, aste, senaron. We're going to use the yo form here and say dibujé. I drew dibujé. Okay, I'll do one more. Bailar, again, is an AR verb. We're going to remove our AR and we're going to add back our AR endings. Um, so we're saying that you, tú, were the one who danced. So tú bailaste is our ending here. So tú bailaste. I'll do one more for you here and with an ER verb for leer. We're going to chop off our ER and in the yo form for an ER verb we use an I with an accent. E, este, yo, imos, y se estieron. We're using the I form here. So we should say leí. Leí. I read. Go ahead and give your audio a brief little pause for me please. I'd like for you to give numbers three five, and six a try, all the remaining ones. Go ahead and give me a pause. Okay, hopefully you had a moment to try these as we look at number three. We're saying that he sang el cantar. We're going to chop off our AR and cantar. We need to go back up and find the he box for our endings, which would be an O here. So we're saying that el cantó. He sang. Tu encender. You turned on or you lit. So for encender, we're going to chop off our ER. In the two form, we need to add back, iste. So tu 
encendiste, you lit. And he learned el en aprender, again, we're going to remove our er en aprender. For an er verb, we're going to find the he box, which our ending should be io. And we're going to say that el aprendió. El aprendió. Don't forget your accent there as well. El aprendió. He learned. Okay? Don't forget you have an accent on the yo form and the el, ella, usted form for all of the regular preterite verbs. Okay, so you might be saying, oh, that's not too bad, not too bad. And hope you're correct, that's not horrible. You just have to know the endings, right, and be able to apply them. Well, there are some verbs that do not follow these rules. I'm sure that's surprising. Uh, in every language, there are irregular verbs. So we'll talk here about some verbs that are irregular, uh, only in the yo form, uh, in the preterite tense. We've nicknamed these car, gar, and czar verbs. Okay, because you'll notice they end in either car, gar, or czar. Um, these aren't horribly irregular. Let's look here at the verb tocar, to play, referring to music, to play music. As you look at tocar, you know that the first thing we do to conjugate a verb is chop off the AR. So we can go ahead and do that, remove our AR. We're left with T-O-C. And I find my preterite endings, a, aste, o, amos, aste, senaron. Now let's throw those on there. We're pretty close, not too bad. However, the yo form is irregular. So notice all these others were fine. Tocaste, toco, tocamos, tocaste, tocaron. If we just add an e here, we get tose, which is just wrong. So in this case, you need the irregular yo form. Um, verbs that end in car change to k. Remember that. Car changes to K, so we get toke. It's only this yo form that's irregular. Look at a verb that ends in gar, G-A-R. Uh, this is the verb jugar, which means to play. Um, jugar, we remove our A-R, we're left with J-U-G. We add our endings, A, aste, O, amos, astes, and aron, and we get J-U-G-E with an accent, jugaste, jugo, Jugamos, jugastes, and jugaron. Now, again, all of these are correct except for the yo form, because remember verbs that end in car, gar, or czar in the preterite have irregular yo forms. Car changes to k. Gar changes to gay. G U E. One more time. Car verbs change to k. Gar verbs change to gay. So all the others are correct. Jugaste, jugo, jugamos, jugastes, jugaron. But gar changes to gay. Okay? So car verbs change to K. Gar verbs change to gay. Let's figure out what happens with czar verbs. As we look at almorzar, which means literally to lunch or to have lunch. Um, almorzar, we're going to chop off our AR. We're left with A-L-M-O-R-Z. We're going to add our preterite endings, a, aste, o, amos, astes, aron. Throw those on there. You can probably guess what's going to happen here. Everything is correct except this yo form. So, almorzaste, almorzó, almorzamos, almorzastes, almorzaron. All those are good. But we can't um, just leave this as a z-e. Um, in this case, czar verbs change to se only in the yo form. So, your little cheat here. Verbs that end in car, gar, or czar in the preterite tense will have a stem change only in the yo form. Verbs that end in car change to k, q u e. Verbs that end in gar change to gay, g u e. And verbs that end in czar change to se. We call these car, gar, czar verbs. Okay? Practice makes perfect, so let's give these a try. You have the yo form of jugar, which you may be very tempted just to chop off this AR and throw an E on there, but we don't say jugé, we say jugué, because verbs that end in gar change to gué, only in the yo form. Please take a moment, pause your audio, and give numbers two through five a try. Okay, hope you've had a moment to try these. Number two, we're still using the verb jugar, um, but we're doing it in the two form. So we are just going to chop off our AR. We're going to add our two ending and say 
jugaste. Number three, same kind of thing. We're using tocar. It's not the yo form, so it's going to be regular. We're going to chop off our AR and throw back an O with an accent. So you get toko. Tokar, however, is a car verb and it is in the yo form. So with tokar, I'm going to take off the entire car. And you know that verbs that end in car change to. Good, hopefully you're saying K. So we should throw a K on there. Toke. And last one, nosotros en pagar. It's not in the yo form, so I'm just going to take off my AR and pagar and add back amos. We should get pagamos. Don't know why that was smaller. Sorry. Pagamos. Okay, something you might be asked to do this week on my Spanish lab are not only to um, look at these verbs and conjugate them, but also to look at their meanings. So, number one gives you mis padres, my parents, me, to or for me, and then merendar, to snack, or llamar, to call, por teléfono anoche. So my parents snacked me on the phone last night, or they called me on the phone last night. Hopefully you're saying that llamar is the correct option. However, we can't just say llamar. We need to take llamar and conjugate it by chopping off the AR. We're saying my parents were the ones who called, so they called. If you look back at your preterite endings for our they box, we're going to use aron. So mis padres me llamaron. Two or four me, they called. Okay, hopefully you're starting to feel better about this whole process. We've covered indirect object pronouns, gustar and similar verbs, and our car cars are verbs in the preterite. Next, we're going to talk about hacer with time expressions. And with these time expressions, you may be asking, how long has it been since you blah, blah, blah? Okay, um, now this is where Spanish becomes somewhat like math in that I'm going to give you a formula to follow. Okay, your formula here, um, cuánto tiempo hace que, and a verb in the, in the past, in the preterite. So, cuánto tiempo hace que, how long has it been since, blah, blah, blah. So, cuánto tiempo hace que comiste en Chick-fil-A. How long has it been since you ate in Chick-fil-A. In this case, we are taking comiste en Chick-fil-A, and comiste is conjugated in the preterite from the verb comer, to eat. We chopped off the er and added back iste. So how long has it been since comiste in Chick-fil-A? Um, so your two options here you have to respond to this. How long has it been since you ate at Chick-fil-A? Um, well, hace plus a time expression plus que plus a verb in the preterite. So hace has been dos días, two days, que since Comí en Chick-fil-A, or comí allí. So it has been two days since I ate in Chick-fil-A. Notice the blue part here, comí, is a verb in the preterite. So the question was asked using comer, cuánto tiempo hace que comiste en Chick-fil-A? And your answer is responding using comer. Hace dos días que comí allí. It's been two days since I ate there. Um, now, you can flip it around and do it the other way. You can use a verb in the preterite. Hace in a time expression, comí allí hace dos días. And both are perfectly acceptable. So whichever one floats your boat here, either um, hace dos días que comí allí or comí allí hace dos días. You're just reordering some of the things here. So either one of these is perfectly acceptable. Um, so altogether again, cuánto tiempo hace que comiste en Chick-fil-A, hace dos días que comí allí or comí allí hace dos días. Um, so very quick there. The last thing we're going to talk about are stem changing verbs in the preterite. So you may remember when we went back to Spanish 1, uh, you had what we called boot verbs, okay? Um, I taught you the verb poder, to be able to. Poder had a stem change from O to UE, but it only stem changed when it was inside of the boot, which included all of these boxes in our magical box with the exception of the nosotros and the vosotros. So instead of podo, we ended up with puedo. Instead of podes, we ended up with puedes. So puedo, puedes, puede, podemos, podes, and pueden. It only changed when it was inside of the boot. Otherwise, it just remained an O. Okay? There were other kind of stem changes we discussed, including E to IE and E to I, as well as U to UE. Now, um, in the preterite tense, um, we no longer have a boot, 
but we do have something kind of similar. So, now it's important that you understand the only verbs that stem change in the preterite are those that are IR verbs. They ain't an IR. They must also be stem changers in the present tense. Okay, and if this happens, they're going to change only in the third person singular and plural boxes, the bottom left and the bottom right boxes. I call this the sandal. Okay, let's talk about it. So here's an example. In the present tense, you know the verb dormir means to sleep. Dormir ends in IR, so check, it's an IR verb. Dormir in the present tense has a stem change from O to UE. Okay, so it's an IR verb and it's a stem changer. Boom, we've got two of the requirements. In the present tense, it changed from O to UE, only inside of the boot here. Duermo, duermes, duerme, dormimos, dormis, and duerme. In the preterite, therefore, it is going to stem change not from O to UE, but only from O to U, and it will stem change only when it's inside of the sandal. So, dormir, you just removed your IR, dormi, dormiste, dormimos, dormiste. It's totally normal, just chopping off your IR, adding the preterite tense. Down here, though, in the sandal, or um, what some of my students in a previous semester named the snake in the boot from Toy Story, um, they changed the O here to only a U instead of a UE. So, durmio and durmieron. Okay, only in this third person singular and third person plural forms. Okay, another example for you. The verb mentir in the present tense, mentir is to lie, mentir has a stem change from e to ie in the present tense. Therefore, it becomes miento, mientes, miente, mentimos, mentis, and mienten. It changed inside the boot in the present tense, changing everywhere except for the nosotros and vosotros, and it changed from e to ie in the present here. In the preterite tense, Mentir, therefore, rather than changing from E to IE, will only change from E to I, and the stem change only occurs in the sandal. So mentir is normal. We've chopped off our IR. Menti, mentiste, mentimos, mentistes. But here in the third person singular and third person plural, you also see a stem change from E to I. So mintio and mintieron. Okay? And our last type here. Um, the verb servir is an IR verb. Check, it's an IR verb. It has a stem change from E to I. Check, okay, uh, which means in the present, it stem changes everywhere in the boot. Sirvo, sirves, sirve, servimos, servis, sirven. In the preterite tense, it is still going to change from E to I, but only in the sandal. So, sirvio and sirvieron. So, in summary, something to help you remember these. There are some conditions that must be met. It must be an IR verb. It must have a stem change in the present tense. If in the present tense it stem changes from O to UE in the boot, it's only going to change from O to U in the sandal. If in the present tense it stem changes from E to IE in the boot, it's only going to change from E to I in the sandal. And if in the present tense it stem changes from E to I in the boot, it's still going to stem change from E to I in the preterite, but only in the sandal. Okay, you have these diagrams here to help you. Some commonly used sandal verbs um, are listed for you here from your textbook. Um, in this case, the first uh, couple of letters before the comma in the parenthesis here, the IE in this case, with preferir is the stem change that it has in the present tense. After the comma, you see the stem change that it has in the preterite, only in the sample. Okay, um, there's also another type of stem changer we refer to as what we call the Y group preterite. Um, this applies to both ER and IR verbs that are preceded by vowels. Um, and in this case, the I changes to a Y only in the third person plural form. Some common verbs here are creer, to believe, leer, to read, and oír, to hear. For example, with the verb leer, just like any other verb, you're going to chop off your er to conjugate. 
we're left with le all the way down. Um, as I look at my regular preterite tense endings for an er or an ir verb, I have e, iste, eo, imos, istes, and ieron. Let's smack those on there, and we end up with this. Leí, leíste, leímos, leístes. Those are no problem. Down here, we have three vowels in a row. Le, io, and le, ieron. Those are just hard to say, okay? Those are just weird, hard to say. So, in this case, the I's are going to change to Y's. So you end up with leyó and leyeron. Okay, so very careful with those, leyó and leyeron. And there should be an accent here on the O. Sorry, I'm slacking, guys. Okay, so leyó and leyeron. Okay, so this I to Y change, one more time, only applies to verbs that end in ER and IR and who have stems that end in a vowel, like leer, my ending was ER, my stem was LE, it ended in an E. Creer, um, ended to have my ER, I'm left with CRE, my E, the end of the stem here is a vowel. Same thing with OIR, you're left with an O. In this case, uh, the third person singular and third person plural forms receive a Y. So leyó and leyeron, creyó and creyeron, and oyó and oyeron. I'm going to give you an opportunity to practice a few of these. There are four questions. I'll do number one for you, and then I'm going to give you a moment to pause me and give these stem changers a try. Okay, so number one gives you the verb oír, to hear. The subject is tú, and it gives you las noticias esta mañana. So we're asking, did you hear the news this morning? So did you hear oír is normal because it's not in the third person singular or third person plural forms. It's not in the he, she, or the they box. So for oír, I'm going to chop off my ir. I'm going to add back my regular preterite ending for the to form. Did you hear? And I'm going to say oíste. Did you hear? Oíste. Did you hear the news? Yes, I heard the news, but I didn't believe them. So go ahead, pause your audio, and give these a try. Okay, now that you've had a moment to try, did you hear the news this morning? Yes, I, them, heard, the them, last year referring back to news, so I heard them, oe, oe, I heard the news. Um, but no, las, but them, I did not believe. No las creí. I didn't believe them. Again, these are fine because they're not in the singular third person or plural third person forms. So all those are just normal. You're just throwing your normal endings on there. Okay. Our last one though, it says mis padres, my parents. No las blank tampoco. So my parents didn't believe them either. So now we're going to take creer. We're going to chop off our ER, and we're going to look at our regular preterite endings of ieron. If we throw that back on there, you're going to see an error. You have three vowels here, because our stem ended in an E, a vowel. Your I is going to change to a Y, so you should get mis padres no las creyeron tampoco. They didn't believe them either. As far as my Spanish lab goes this week, you may be asked to go through and identify the correct preterite form in a series. For example, number one, los niños blank ocho horas anoche. So the children blank eight hours last night. Um, you're going to see with children or they, you can automatically cross out B and C because those are in the yo form. You're left with either prefirieron or durmieron. In this case, the children preferred eight hours last night where they slept eight hours last night. You can probably identify that slept is better. Notice the dormir usually has an O to U-E stem change in the present tense in the boot. So therefore in the preterite, it only changed from O to U, and this only happened in the sandal. Um, number two, ayer blank ustedes las noticias, no? So yesterday, you all heard the news, right? Or you all ordered the news, right? Obviously heard is the better option, so we can cross out pedir because it doesn't make sense in the sentence. We're left with oyeron or oyo because it's ustedes. You can match up that oyeron is the correct answer. If we were walking through the correct process here, 
uh, we would take our verb of oír here, chop off our ir and add back ieron. Because our stem ended in a vowel, our i is going to change to a y in the third person plural form. So we end up with oyeron. Okay, so I'm hoping that these videos have been helpful to you guys. Please remember these should not be used as a replacement for reading the chapter. They should not be used as a replacement for my Spanish lab tutorials. You should still be reading your book. You should still be practicing in my Spanish lab. This is just here as a supplement to help you because I know that this content is rather difficult. And especially in an online class, I want you to feel like you have the support that you need to be successful. Okay, so good luck to you all. Have a wonderful week and take care.